Welcome to the Peaceful Parenting Podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Rosensweet, mom of three young people, peaceful parenting coach, and your cheerleader and guide on all things parenting. Each week, we'll cover the tools, strategies, and support you need to end the yelling and power struggles and encourage your kids to listen and cooperate so that you can enjoy your family time. I'm happy to say we have a great relationship with our three kids. The teen years have been easy and joyful, not because we're special unicorns, but because my kids were raised with peaceful parenting. I've also helped so many parents just like you stop struggling and enjoy their kids again. I'm excited to be here with you today and bring you the insight and information you need to make your parenting journey a little more peaceful. Let's dive into this week's conversation. Hey all, welcome back to another episode of the Peaceful Parenting Podcast. Today's episode is a coaching call with Aaron and Wade, parents of three kids. Before we dive in, just a couple of quick things. One is that if you are interested in some coaching, either with me or with one of my coaches, Corey or Stoney, you can sign up for either a coaching call or a free short consult to see how we can help you and get a little taste of what parent coaching is like. To do so, you can go to sarahrosensweet.com slash coaching and all the info is there, including the link to sign up for a free short consult, help you as much as I can in 20 minutes or for a coaching session. And the other thing I want to make sure you know about is my How to Stop Yelling at Your Kids free e-course. So if you are having some trouble with self-regulation, which is always the place we want to start when we want to be peaceful parents, is to know how to calm ourselves so that we can respond to our child rather than react in annoyance or frustration or anger. The place to start is always with with that piece of self-regulation. And it doesn't mean that you don't get upset. It just means that you know what to do when you're feeling upset. So if you would like some support around that, you can go to sarahrosensweet.com slash yelling. That's sarahrosensweet.com slash yelling for my free e-course, totally free. It's a really, really great course. I've had a couple thousand of people go through it and I've gotten some really great feedback about it. And so let's dive in and meet Aaron and Wade. The biggest things that we talked about or what to do when you're feeling burnt out as a parent. That was really big for them. They don't have a lot of support and they have three kids who are pretty close in age and especially one who's pretty challenging. And we also talked about some anxiety they were feeling around dinner time or meal time and eating. And we also talked about some ways to support their kiddo who's quite spirited and has some sensory issues. So have a listen. I hope you find it helpful. I know it's people tell me all the time that it's really helpful to hear these coaching calls and to know that that they're not alone and to hear how other people solve some of their problems and helps helps us solve all of our problems. So let's meet Aaron and Wade. Hi Aaron, hi Wade. Welcome to the podcast. Hi Sarah, thanks for having us. Tell us a little bit about yourselves and your family. Okay. I'm Erin, and my husband, Wade, is here with me. Hello. Uh, We have four children. Nolan, who would have been almost eight this coming January. Kyla, who's six and a half years old. Grayson, who is a newly minted five-year-old in October. I'm sure he doesn't let you forget that. (laughs) No, he doesn't. And Delaney, who is a newly minted four-year-old this month. All right. We also have some horses and two cats and a dog, and we live in New England. Nice. So we ch- we chatted a little bit before we started recording and um, it was kind of like a where to start moment because we've, you know, coming out of COVID, you know, you were telling me that you don't have much family or social support where you are and that your kids have some, they're, they're not your ordinary out of the box kiddos. You might have, they have some, some extra challenges. Do you want to just mention a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So you, you mentioned some of the extra challenges, um, I guess I'll kind of start there. You know, Grayson has been, I guess you could say, diagnosed with sensory processing disorder, SPD. And uh, you've talked about that in some of your other podcasts. But, you know, basically his, his brain is not wired like a lot of other children. Uh, what's that phrase? Neurodivergent. And then he also has some speech delays, which kind of makes things a little more challenging. Um, so that's one of our, our challenges. And then Delaney also has some speech delays. And Kyla, I guess you could say, is a bit of a perfectionist, which she definitely gets from my wife and I. We're both perfectionists <laughs> as well. How does the perfectionism show up? With- if she's like, say, drawing something and she messes up, sometimes she'll just have a large reaction and like wad it up or throw it and, and say that, you know, it's it's ruined. And I'm never doing this again. Yeah. You know. oh, no. But we also see it in other things where I guess I'll say she apologizes a lot for things when... 
when she makes a mistake or something. And I think part of that's maybe because in the past we've overreacted because we're perfectionists. That's definitely something we know we need to work on. That's insightful. I mean, I think we we talked about that in a recent episode. We'll link to it in the show notes about perfectionism and that our sometimes our reactions in the moment can lead to that, like, oh, I just messed up and my mom or dad or caregiver's unhappy with me, right? So it's great that you recognize that and that that's something that you're working on. Yeah. Let's see. And what about Grayson? You said he's got some sensory challenges. Is that sensory seeking, sensory avoidant, combination? Where did, How does that show up? It's mostly sensory avoidant. He has auditory sensitivities, a lot of tactile sensitivities. I'm trying to think. That's also paired with anxiety, in particular separation anxiety from Wade and I. Um, and at night, it turns more toward like a proprioceptive seeker. You know, he, he seeks that heavy input of jumping, you know, landing hard on his feet. And he struggles a lot with social pragmatics, you know, reading people's social cues. He will tend to get in Kyla and Delaney's personal space quite a bit, especially at night when he seems to be more um, seeking that input, climbing Mm -hmm. on the couches, you know, jumping off of them. It also shows up in more subtle ways too, where like if, if we're going somewhere, let's say, and it's cold out, you know, we ask him to get ready. Sometimes it's a struggle because he won't have his favorite pair of pants in there where he he only wear pants if it's a certain texture, you know, or, and, and sometimes it is even a struggle to do that. Where in the past, like he wouldn't wear long sleeve shirts. He's getting a little better about that now. You know, we are doing occupational therapy, which hopefully is helping with some of that as well. And does your does your OT have things for you to work on at home in terms of, you know, I know OTs talk about a sensory diet, which is like a prescribed set of you know, games that you might play or exercises that you might do that you make sure to include every day to meet some of those sensory needs to help him, help him so that he's not so sensory seeking. Is there anything like that that you work on? She does. She actually sends us home more with, because he does, what he does is he does about two hours every Friday of OT. And that's divided between eating and I guess you would call it traditional occupational therapy. So most of the things that she sends home for us to work on center around eating, but we have done things at our home. Like we actually have a a yoga swing, an aerial yoga swing installed in our, I call it the learning room because we homeschool. Right. We forgot to mention that you homeschool on top of all of this. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So we have a, an aerial yoga swing in there that's really open for anybody to use when they need a break and some calm, quiet time. Is he willing to go and do that? Like you said, you know, he'll be climbing all over his sisters. If you suggest that he goes to the swing, is he willing to do that? Definitely. He, Good. he loves the swing. And a lot of times we'll have to say to him, okay, buddy, you know, chair or swing. You know, if you don't make the choice, I'm going to choose because he can't really handle when he's dysregulated a lot of auditory input. Mm -hmm. So we try to keep the words to a a minimum. Good, good. A lot of times he'll just choose to go to the swing on his own. And it's kind of off the kitchen where it is. So it's Mm -hmm. kind of a calm place, but it's centralized because usually one of us is typically in the kitchen (laughs) all the time, either cooking or doing dishes or so he, he will choose that. I did. I have a visual schedule as well on the board in our learning room, which is another tool we've been using. So to help with the anxiety, to know what's coming up, like mostly the big events of the day. So he knows, okay, today's Monday and we have our nature group. You know, tomorrow's Tuesday and we have art or Spanish. Wednesday, you know, we have piano lessons. We did try like a, a, a more detailed morning schedule to help sometimes when he would wake up dysregulated and I laminated them and I put the stickies on, but it didn't really seem to to stick with him. What does it look like when he wakes up dysregulated? Oh, Oh, before we, before we go there, I just want to ask you, do you have a trampoline? We do. Okay, great. I'll try one that has a little handle on it that they can grab onto and jump on it. Yeah. Yeah. Great. The other thing I was thinking of is, you know, I don't know if there's, if he, if there's something he can sit on like a, a squeak, like something like a yoga ball or something when you're watching TV, when he's watching TV, because you mentioned that sometimes that happens when he's, you know, that they get to watch a show and he's climbing all over his sisters. I wonder if he could like sit and bounce on a yoga ball or something so he could actually have that sensory input while he's, I mean, I'm not an OT. This is just something I thought of, but you know, well, while he's watching the show with his sisters that would kind of give him that input so he could do both things. Yeah, that might be a, a good yeah, suggestion. A really good idea. Grayson actually used to 
we have a rocking chair in our living room and he used to rock, you know, pretty regularly during Great. the show. He kind of stopped doing that yeah, though. Yeah, he's kind of, he's since but, stopped. But I'm wondering if the ball maybe is kind of related to that and if yeah. he could find something to do with his body, you know, that gives him some input well, Yeah, he's doing that. Then I, I can see a ball kind of becoming top, It could, yeah, it could become a projectile. projectile. <laughs> But what this I'm wondering is try because you can always take it away. If have it, you if seen it, the round seats? That yeah, this. What are they? I forget. I was like trying to think of the name. Cushions. Of them. Yeah, I don't know what you're talking about? But I, I'm wiggle thinking, a wiggle a wiggle seat. I think yeah, I'm wondering if maybe that's an idea rather than the ball, so we can't like throw it. It's like, yeah, we brought. I think they use those in classrooms sometimes for kids yeah. who have a hard time sitting still. Uh, that wiggle like a wiggle chair. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good idea. Yeah. Yeah. So part of it is also the dietary. Um, struggles as well i guess you could say he's a bit of a seeker when it comes to his diet like he likes really spicy bold things. flavors yeah bold mm. flavors and we have, we struggle trying to get him to eat m- most normal foods <laughs> like he'll eat cucumber he goes through phases he'll eat it so much because it's the only thing he'll eat he and then he burned gets out. burned out of it and mm. then switches to maybe some new food or something mm-hmm. um but like peanut butter and jelly it yeah. used to be a, a staple. Now it's just peanut butter. No, it's okay. He used to eat carrots with A1. That was a weird combination <laughs> that he tried and stuck with him for a while. He's burnt out of that. Now he'll eat cucumbers, I think. He'll do steak, but like beef is pretty much yeah. not really there. He used to do taco meat. Now he doesn't really do that. He used to do meatloaf. Doesn't really do that. Doesn't do any chicken. Like It just is really a challenge. And then when you couple it with another picky eater or two they all seem to have their things that they like to don't like and dinner is very stressful here we also try i should mention we try to keep a low to no sugar content in the house and try to look for minimally processed food so that makes it even more challenging and i just thought of another thing delaney is dairy sensitive i guess i'll say okay we try to limit dairy as well so we have all these things at play and like (laughs) and then we try to not burn ourselves out from eating the same thing all the time you know, we try to have like one safe food that we yeah. think everyone will eat, but we're not really sure what to do with the rest, you know, okay. desserts, you know, do you let them go to town? Well, you- the, so the big, before we started recording, you had mentioned that you listened to the podcast episode that I had with Jen, Jennifer House, who's the family tr- nutritionist and what she and lots of other people will link to that one in the show notes if anyone else didn't catch it. What she and other nutritionists recommend is the division of responsibility, the Ellen Satter division of responsibility. So just briefly, that's the parent's responsibility is you decide what the kids eat and when they decide if they eat it and how much. And what they say, what the division of responsibility says about sweets is that you do offer them, you don't have them, you know, every day, every meal, but that you do offer them at a regular time, you know, maybe a couple times a week, you have a snack that's ice cream or or you have chips or, you know, some some food that's not everyday food. And, and I think they also say that you shouldn't really call them treats or, or junk food or, you know, we're, we don't want to prioritize the food, but that we just maybe call it food we don't eat every day, right? So that, that you don't have it in the house if it's something that you don't want to eat every day, but that maybe, you know, you go to the store and you get some dairy-free ice cream for Lainey and ice cream for for everybody else. And then everybody has ice cream for a snack that day. And so that's sort of, that's sort of what we did when my kids were growing up is we didn't really have it as a, on the regular, but if we went to a birthday party or a potluck or something, they could kind of eat as much as they wanted, or, you know, if it was Halloween or their birthdays and their birthday cake, kind of just eat it till it's gone. And then we don't have it on the regular. Is that something that sounds like maybe you could try? Yeah. So the Halloween thing, it's kind of funny, actually, We just finished last year's Halloween candy before this year's Halloween (laughs) because we tried to like just kind of dole out like a piece or two at a time as as a dessert. And so that's they have a fresh refill now and their buckets are full and they're constantly asking if they can have it. Right. So do we say yes or do we do like once or twice a week? Do we do it at not a meal time? You know, what do you think is the best there? Also, is dessert an acceptable term for, you know, because we're trying to stay away from treats like you said but Mm -hmm. well what what kinds of things do you have for dessert let's see well the dairy-free ice cream is one of them halloween candy is another one what the what the division of responsibility suggests with dessert is that you offer it at the same time as dinner that you you know and it's not unlimited 
you know, you don't eat not as much ice cream as you want at dinner, but if dessert is going to be one piece of Halloween candy or a, a small bowl of ice cream or whatever, that you put it on the table at the same time as the dessert. And they can eat first if they want to. Yeah. But then once it's done, that's it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the idea is, you know, maybe some nutritionists out there will correct me if I'm wrong, but my, I'm not an expert in this division of responsibility, but my understanding is that it is occasionally you offer it that they have as much as they want, but not on the a regular basis that it's as much as they want. I see. What we did with the Halloween candy was our kids ate as much as they wanted, like literally for the day of Halloween and then one day afterwards. And I think on candy day, that was what it was called, candy day. They All they ate for the entire day was candy. No one ever threw up, but they literally only ate candy for that, like the whole day. I mean, they could have other stuff, but then, and I, I, I don't think this goes with the division of responsibility, but then they would trade it in for a toy or 10 bucks after that yeah. day. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, maybe with inflation, you might have to do more than 10 bucks. But <laughs> I know that my best friend is a pediatric occupational therapist. And she's told me like, the most important thing you can do with mealtime is removing the stress. Yes. And that is really challenging for me because I get so hung up on even just like, are they getting their macronutrients? You know, are they getting their protein? Are they? And so I just I guess I get so wound up that they're you know, with the Halloween candy or, or whatever it might be, the ice cream, that they're getting an excessive amount of refined sugar. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, for me, the reason why we did that, the, you know, sort of the candy all at once thing was because I didn't want them to eat sugar every day. Like I, when I was growing up, it was like, you can have one or two pieces every day until your Halloween candy is gone. But as you said, that took you almost a full year of candy right. almost every day, right? So for me, and, and actually my dentist agreed with me, it's much better to eat it all at once than to have a little bit every day. And that worked for our family. Might not work for people with kids with some, you know, sugar sensitivities or or different things, but it worked for us. And it might be something that you, you know, you you experiment with. And in terms of what your friend said about that uh, the best thing, the most important thing about mealtimes is they're not stressful. I would agree. And I also think that you want it to be a warm you know, connecting family time. Maybe that's a little less important for you because you see your kids more. But for some people, maybe one of, you know, one of the only hours in the day that they see their kids if is during dinner. And so you don't want it to be like a battleground, right? Yeah. And in terms of your fears, you know, if your kids get regular checkups, what do your, what does your doctor say about their growth chart? And yeah, that's their, what my friend told me too. She said, what, what, what did the doctor say? And Grayson actually has his checkup this Friday, so I'm anxious to see where that is. But the Kyla and Delaney had theirs about two weeks ago, and they're average or just slightly above average on the. Great, so they're growing. You know, they're. It doesn't really. It's not as important where they are in the growth chart as long as they're on their own growth chart yeah. healthily, right? Like that they're where they're supposed to be in terms of growing and, and gaining the amount of weight that's right for them, and you know, growing the amount that's right for them. And I always want to preface that. And when we start talking about food, because if someone is concerned about their, their kids' growth or their doctor's concerned about it, you know, they might need extra help outside of a parenting coach. And I don't, don't want to lead anyone astray. But if, you know, I think you can safely follow the division of responsibility, and especially because you are getting some, and I want to hear more about the help that Grayson needs with his sensory stuff, because that's the other thing that you want to think about when you're going to implement this division of responsibility is, do we have concerns about their health and how they're growing? Or are there sensory challenges that maybe come into play that we need to be aware of? And it sounds like you you are aware of that, but what is what are his sensory challenges that come up around food? He's a texture eater for sure, what would you say? It's just... Well, he just doesn't eat most of the foods <laughs> that we put down you know, we, it's really hard to try to find a meal that has a safe food for everyone that isn't like the same thing every day. You know, like we can well, say- Hold on, Wade, what's wrong with the same thing every day? Uh, I mean, maybe you and, and Aaron don't want to eat the same thing every day and you could have something else, but if yeah. your kids are okay with the same thing every day- It just seems like it, it's counterintuitive to what I know about nutrition. You know, you want to have a, a, a variety of foods and if they just eat hot dogs and mac and cheese every day- and they won't eat anything else, then that doesn't seem like they would be very healthy in the long run. Well, I did hear you say carrots, cucumbers. Do they eat fruit? Yeah, so that's essentially what ends up happening at dinner time is we usually end up putting out a spread of 
strawberries, cucumbers, carrots, raspberries, whatever fruit is on hand. And we've kind of told them, we've recently started implementing within the last few weeks, any fruit or veggie you can have unlimited mm-hmm. of at dinner time. You don't need to ask. Like, because Grayson was, we were trying the SOS method of feeding with him from OT. And Okay. It, I don't know about that. I thought somebody talked about it in one of your podcasts. Yeah, I think so. It's basically yeah. you try to work in stages, and right? Like, so you want them to end up like, first they tolerate and they have a learning plate and they tolerate the food on the learning plate. And then it works up to they tolerate on their plate and then they like smell it. They put it to their lips. Oh, okay. Yeah. Like a sensory sensory exploration. Right. So yeah, I didn't know it kind of SOS. encourages a lot of play yeah. with the food. Yes. Put the uh, olives on your fingers and walk right. around the table. <laughs> it was making dinner really stressful. Okay. So my friend who's an OT also said, drop all of that. And okay. She gave us a different routine to go to. Because it was becoming where, you know, Grayson especially would go to the refrigerator. Can I have a, a a perfect, like a, a, I think they're a protein bar, right? Perfect bars. It's a peanut butter base. It's like bar. a peanut butter bar. Okay. You know, can I have this? Can I have that? And it was becoming really stressful. And she said, you know, basically just go take that back and say, you know, what's on the table is what's for dinner. Yeah. Besides, yep. fruits, besides that's fruits the part and vegetables. of the Just kind of what we were doing yeah. before OT, and we were kind of back to where we are with just we have an array of food on the table, some some kind of carb, a bunch of fruits, and maybe a veggie. And a protein. It's great. But it's to the point like where I think Delaney is actually worse than Grayson with being choosy with her foods. I, the only way I can get any kind of fruit or veggie into her is she'll eat sliced strawberries. But I have to give her these dairy-free smoothies from Stonyfield. And they don't really have veggies into them. Or sometimes in the morning I can make her a protein shake and I sneak in spinach and banana and she'll drink that. But she won't. You know, everybody's on a multivitamin, but I can't. There's no vegetables. Veggies. That's- yeah, so, no so it's so Jennifer House, who we were just talking about. Shout out Jennifer. She actually in my membership last month. We our theme was feeding kids, and somebody asked her about fruit. Like my kid eats tons of fruit, but won't eat any vegetables. She says that's totally fine. She said fruit and vegetables actually have a lot of the same nutrients in them, and if your kid eats lots of fruits, don't worry about them eating vegetables. Just continue to enjoy your own vegetables and that, you know, that they see you enjoying their bro- your broccoli. They're not, you're not pressuring them to eat the broccoli and that they're thinking someday I'll like broccoli too because my mom and dad like broccoli. But if they're eating fruits and you did say there were a couple of, a couple of vegetables that they're eating, I think you do get a lot of the overlap in terms of the nutrients that are in fruit versus vegetables. Even so if, she gave my members a permission slip yeah. to not worry about them eating vegetables so that they could just, as their kids were eating fruits, that was enough. Yeah. Well, we end up having to put all these out at the same time because, you know, like Lainey will eat the strawberries, Kylo will eat the cucumbers, Grayson might do the carrots, but they don't necessarily always overlap with everyone eating all of them. Right? Okay. Right? So we'll throw them all out on the table and it's just, it's just a lot of work for us. And maybe there's, there's no better way, you know. Literally the only whole fruit or veggie that Delaney will eat is a strawberry. We've tried everything too. We've tried star fruit. We've tried kiwi. We've tried, you name it. So she's only four Mm -hmm. and you know, these things change rapidly. So I think, I think you need to give yourself a big dose of compassion, first of all, for how much work this is and how hard you're working at it. And also just like, this is a moment in time, right? This is just a moment in time. It's not going to be like this forever things change. And, you know, she's growing fine. She seems healthy from what you've said. Your doctor gave you a good, a good checkup a couple weeks ago. So maybe this is a moment where you recognize, oh, my, my own anxiety is popping up a bit here. And, and what can you tell yourself about, you know, when your fear comes up, what can you tell yourself? That's a literal question. Do you have any ideas? I know. I think I need some kind of positive affirmation. Yeah. Like a mantra. Yeah. She's growing well. How about that? Yeah, that's a good one. Even if she only eats strawberries or even though she only eats strawberries right now in this moment, she's growing well. Yeah. She's growing well. She has a lot of energy and, you know, talk to your worry brain. If you listen to the podcast, you know about the worry brain. Oh, yeah. You listen to Lynn Lyons too, uh, you had mentioned. And so, you know, talk back to that worry brain that's making mealtime so stressful for you because you're worried that they're not eating enough of the, quote, right foods. Yeah, I think a lot of it 
personally stems from my own fear and my own poor relationship I've had with food, you know, using food as an emotional coping Mm -hmm. skill and becoming an emotional eater. And I guess I just fear I don't want that for my kids and I want them to eat whole fruits and veggies and Well, they're little and a lot of little kids are, you know, some kids are not picky. Some little kids are picky. But what the research shows is the more pressure you put on them to try things or eat things, the worse eaters they become. Like that's that's been shown over and over again in the research. So you're doing exactly the right thing in order for them to not develop problematic relationships with food as they get older, which is to let them follow their their own body's cues of hunger and fullness And to, you know, there sounds like they are eating a balanced diet. If you look at over the course of, you know, a week rather than one meal at a time, if you look over the course of a week, I bet you'll find that they're eating a a balanced diet. So something I want to ask you too is, because I know I have this, I guess, the, the old ways of authoritarian parents and family members. And so, for example, on Thanksgiving, there was turkey. Mm-hmm. We know that Grayson is not going to touch turkey with a 10 foot pole. So, for example, like something we might do for mealtime is like, all right, we're making chicken. He won't eat chicken. We have leftover steak. Let's heat that up, throw it on his plate, and offer the rest of the sides. You know, so we do, we, those are how our typical dinner times look is do we have something quick? Like, we know he's not going to eat chicken. We don't have leftover steak. Let's get him a yogurt. You know? Great. That sounds like it works for you. And you've, you know, the, the your part of the division of responsibility is you decide what he eats and you're finding things that, you know, you're not going out and buying a steak and cooking it for him when everyone else is having turkey or chicken. And I got to tell you something, my son, who's now 18, when he was that age, he would say, I don't eat birds. And it wasn't because he cared about the animals. I mean, he, I'm sure he did care about the animals, but that wasn't, he would eat cows and pigs, but he would not <laughs> eat birds. He would say, I don't eat birds. I, I don't like chicken. I don't like turkey. He loves chicken and turkey now. Like, you know, these things change. So just remember when Grayson's turning down the the chicken and the turkey, remember Sarah's son who said, I don't eat birds. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, that that makes me feel better. I guess it's hard sometimes to get those voices of those old authoritarian, you know, parents and family members. You're going to eat what I put in front of you or you're not going to eat at all, you know. Yeah, it is hard. And the clean your plate mantra, which I think – from the beginning, we've been very good about because I grew up in a house where it was, you know, you're going to eat what's put in front of you and whatever you put on your plate, you're going to eat. And I felt like that really contributed to my issues with food. And I don't, mm-hmm. I, we've been very good about, you don't need to clean your plate, but just please try to take a smaller portion. Good. And take only what you think you might eat. Good. Yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, it sounds like you're already on your way to them having a different relationship with food. And in terms of the, the, you know, the Thanksgiving thing, I saw some great things from, there's a resource called Kids Eat in Color. I forget her name, but that's her company. Yeah. And she said, your kid only eats the roll. That's fine. You know, they only eat the Thanksgiving roll this year. Maybe next year they'll eat more of it. Yeah. I I really appreciated her things to say to relatives when they, you know, start making comments on what your children are eating. Yeah. Yeah, it's tough. It is tough, especially when you've, you know, you do have at least Grayson with the extra challenges too with the sensory stuff. So I think the question here is how can you balance, you know, putting out this array of food with your own sanity, right? With your own like staying staying sort of grounded and not feeling anxious about what they're eating. And also with, you know, you talked before we started recording about feeling really burnt out. So what are you willing to do? That's a question that you ask, can ask yourselves and don't, you know, don't do more than you're willing to do. Yeah. The the burnt out thing is, is a tough one. You know, we haven't talked much about it on this podcast, but you know, Erin stays home with the kids and she does homeschooling groups and takes them different places. And, you know, it's just 24 seven mom. And I've been fortunate enough during the pandemic, at least to start working from home. So I'm home too. I come down for lunch and then usually my day is done around two thirty, and you know we're so we're always around the kids and just getting the time to ourselves is a real challenge you know and that it, it brings out the worst in us sometimes yeah. you know we get angry we, we take a negative tone and we're starting to see some of that get reflected back at us from mm-hmm. the children you know that today was especially a challenging day I guess for Aaron the kids just were over anything and everything just kind of squabbling so we get some of that yelling 
creeping in from the kids. I'm sure it's just because of us. It's something for us to work on as well. So, so I have, a, I have a confession to make. I'm a failed homeschooler. I, I couldn't be the kind of mom that I wanted to be in homeschool. I couldn't. I couldn't be. I couldn't take being around the kids 24-7. I know some people who homeschool do manage to find communities where they don't they share they share the load a little bit more, but that wasn't possible for us because there wasn't anyone else around us who was homeschooling. And you know, I I tried it, <laughs> tried it three different times, and in the end, my kids basically mostly went to school. So I'm not telling you that I know what's right for your family that you shouldn't homeschool. I do just want to plant a seed in your head, though, that maybe that's something that you think about. You know, every six months you revisit your decision. And just think, is this the right thing for our family? Is this the right thing for us? Can we be the par- kind of parents we want to be while we're doing the homeschooling? And also, you don't have to homeschool all your kids. You know, I know we actually only homeschooled one out of the three. I mean, the two, when we first started, the two were not school age yet. So that's why I had everyone because that, but, but we ended up homeschooling one partly and the other two went to school. So that's just something to think about. I don't know if you want to explore that at all in you know while we're talking or or just put that in your back pocket yeah well it's something we we ask ourselves sometimes you know are we doing the right thing because there are the social challenges and and we feel like maybe they'd be better off in school but we usually talk ourselves out of it and kind of remember the reasons we are homeschooling you know we feel like we can give them the best support here at home we were trying to prepare kyla went to school for pre-k during covid you know, so it's not a good year to judge. It was only like half days or something, not even. It was two hours. I yeah, think. like two hours. But when we were trying to prepare Grayson to go, you know, we talked to the school about the transition plan, try to get him in there, let him see the room because we knew it would just to be- work through the anxiety. Yeah, challenging. And, and they just completely dropped the ball and, and didn't do anything. And, you know, when we finally talked to them, they basically just said, oh, well, you know, a lot of kids have a tough time. You just leave them here and, you know- they'll be fine in a few days, you know, the more they do it. And we're just like, all right, that's, that's not going to work for us. We know there's extra challenges. And um, so that was one of the real motivations to homeschool. The homeschooling itself, like when we transitioned, last year was our first year homeschooling. And then when we, tr- this year, when we transitioned from summer back to, okay, guys, it's time to get back into the routine. The transition was really rough. But other than that, like we have a beautiful daily flow, you mm-hmm. know, especially when we're not running around. And I think that's, Part of my problem is we tend to do a lot of running around. I think part of that is, if I'm honest, I'm afraid to slow down and sit with myself, just mm. due to grief and, and things like that. But, you know, we have a daily flow. They don't argue with me about it. I say, okay, it's time for math. Okay, I'm doing math with you. Now it's time for your brother's math. You go practice piano. We all do language arts together because they're close in age. We do a lot of reading aloud, and I feel like there's a lot of connection. Okay. So the homeschooling part sounds like it is working. Is yeah. Maybe the 24-7 part is not. So what did the right. two of you do to give each other a break? I, I try to force her to do it, but I'll be honest. She she always tries to find what I look at as an excuse not to do it. You know, mm, like, oh, the laundry's so got to be is, done. The truth gotta, is coming out yeah, here, <laughs> Aaron. This or that or, you know, and, and I say that stuff will be there. You know, you, you got to take some time to yourself. But to be fair to her, you know, she, she's the one that organizes everything socially and, and, you know, does all the social media and the groups and Facebook and all that. And without her, we're kind of like a ship without a captain, it seems, you know, so she does get a lot of involvement and she, she, I don't want to say controls the calendar, but it's definitely she's the manager, family, family manager. manager. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's hard. And that was one thing I tried to figure out too, is like around mealtime, because pretty much every night I cook something. You know, and I just, we've now started having like a smorgasbord night. Yeah. And we implemented a family movie night where we're just going to have finger food. And we usually always eat at the table, but we've made a special tradition of once a week. We're all going to sit together and watch a movie and have some finger nice. food. And the kids I love, love it. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of taken a, a load load off just knowing like, okay, it's movie night. We're just doing finger foods. Great. So, but, so Erin, this is what I'm hearing. I'm hearing that. You're both burnt out and you're also, it's hard for you to step away. So this is going to be one of those moments. And I say this in my coaching a lot. You have to decide is what's worse, the problem or the solution. The problem of being burnt out is that you're doing everything and maybe, you know, looking at how can I simplify? Is there something 
that I'm doing that I don't need to do? That's a question for you to go away and think about. And we tend to be control enthusiasts out of our own anxiety, right? And I, I hear you that, you know, that's hard to find people outside of your family that you feel that you can trust. However, you've got Wade here, who's as invested as you are in the health and well-being as your of your children. And how about if we let Wade, you know, give you an hour a day where you go for a walk or you mentioned you have horses or you go for a horseback ride or you go and sit in your car, park down the road and read a book with your tea and a thermos, something where you actually get a little bit of downtime every day. If an hour feels like too much, half an hour. But you're going to have to decide like that it, it's scary to let go of control of everything, right? It's really scary to let go of that control. So what's worse, the problem of your burnout or the solution of letting go of a little control so you can have some me time and do something that refreshes you? Yeah, no, I know you're right. I just. Yeah, it, it's tough to find that time. You know, it's I, like I said, I get done with work around 2.30. Luckily, on most days, I don't have to commute, so I'm available right at 2.30, you know, but usually we're starting dinner around 4.30, you know, and then eating, finishing up. Usually that takes us to about 5 30 But what are you, what are you doing between o'clock. 2 30? The kids might still be on TV or something, so that might give like a little bit of time there, but she also has horses, so she does horse chores at night. Special you know, time. We try to do special time. That's something we haven't talked about. Yeah, I was impressed. You wrote to me about your special time yeah, rotation to, schedule. That was inspiring. We, yeah, we, we don't have enough time to do it for both of us with each kid, you know, but we try to do a 15 minute block of time where each kid is at least with one parent. We Sounds try to do it every day. Doing. Doesn't yeah. Happen. And you know what? The everyday thing, sure, that's the gold standard, but it's pretty unattainable for most people. So I think regular special time is more important than you know, trying for the perfection and then giving up because you can't do it. So I think you're really on the right track with that. And so I'm still going to push back a little bit on this time. I mean, you know, Wade, maybe you also need a little bit of downtime. Everybody does. And maybe you're getting it somewhere else. We were talking specifically about Aaron, but maybe both of you do. So maybe it's, you just aim for each of you. You've, you've been so clever with your special time rotation. Maybe you need to add into that half an hour a day parent time rotation where just each of you gets half an hour to do nothing or to do something that you love that doesn't involve chores or kids or work. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, we, I like the idea of kind of adding it right on almost the same time block. It works out kind of nice though with the three kids and 15 minutes is like a 45 minute block and you can usually find somewhere to squeeze that in. For us as parents, it seems like we might be able to find like 15 minutes or a half hour here and there, but the majority of time it's after the kids are in bed. You know, and by that time we're so burnt out, we don't want to do anything. Well, I mean, other than- I I don't. I'm not suggesting after the kids are in bed because you should really go to sleep. You know, sleep is is really really important. Like that's Lynn Lyon's new book where she talks. It's called The Anxiety Audit. We'll link to it in the show notes. She talks about when quote self care becomes actually. I don't think she uses this word, but destructive. Like that, I'm going to stay up because I haven't any time to myself today. I'm going to stay up and like watch my favorite show or whatever. And in the moment, it can feel like you know, me time or, or filling your cup, but really you should probably be sleeping. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. So what I'm trying to find, and, and maybe it's on the weekend, maybe you each get an hour each day, you know, on the weekend to, to yourself, but, but you have to go away and decide what's worse, the problem or the solution. So why don't we leave you with, I'm going to challenge you to try and find time, not at night because you should be getting enough sleep, you know, eight hours. I know that sounds like a dream, but don't try to give each other time at night, but try to give each other, if you can't find time during the week, on the weekend, some time where you have time that's kid-free, chore-free, work-free, where you just get to be with yourself for that for that hour. Go for a walk, read a book, you know, whatever feels good to you. I'm going to challenge you to relax your anxiety around the, the food thing. And if people are only eating fruit or cucumbers, I think what you're doing is working in terms of just putting some things out and letting them eat. And if, you know, Grayson doesn't want to eat birds and you've got (laughs) some other animal available for him to eat, that's fine too, right? You, you You get to decide. And what's our mantra when, when Lainey doesn't eat anything but some strawberries and her, her shake or whatever, she's growing well. She has energy. Sounds good. Yeah, I, and I'm also looking forward to trying the sitting. Yes, right. The thing the with the, with Grayson's uh, sort of ants in his pants when his sisters are trying to watch TV. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, also I just wanted to share that when you have three kids, 
and you don't have much support and you, especially three kids who are intense and or extra or more as we like to call them, it's hard and you can do everything quote right and still it's hard. It doesn't mean that you're not doing something right. It doesn't mean that you're that you're, you know, not enough. Or I don't know if you saw there was a post today in my Facebook group about this woman who's she has two little kids and she has her cousin who's come to stay or her adult cousin that. who's come. Yeah, yeah. She came to stay has come to stay with them for six weeks and she, she also all of a sudden has help. And she said she realized that how much easier things are now that she has somebody else there to help her that everything that she was beating herself up about before that, you know, I'm not doing a good job. Like, why am I so stressed and burnt out and blah, 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 was because you're actually not meant to be doing all of this by yourself. And that when her cousin came to stay, she kind of went, oh, the reason why I was struggling was because it's really hard to do everything you're meant to do on your own without that village, right? Yeah, that's what that's one thing. That's our reoccurring theme that we always talk about. It's really hard raising children without a village. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it I is. feel like it's it's not like a lack, lack of knowledge, you know, I, yeah. I feel like we're pretty well versed in whatever you want to call it, you know, peaceful parenting, conscious parenting, you know, the, the whole theme, I guess, of parenting. Yeah. You know, we do all the research and we try to implement it, but just implementing it is very tough. It's almost inhuman to try to do all these things at the same time with three children, especially, mm-hmm. you know, it makes it very, very tough. So I'm, I'm, I guess I feel like it's not like... Maybe there's little tips and tricks here, but it's, I think maybe getting that the time to ourselves and try to refresh will be, will be key. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that's why you can't do peaceful parenting without a big dose of self-compassion because if you try to be perfect, which I think some people, you know, misguidedly think of peaceful parenting as like, you never yell and, you know, you're, everyone's always happy and blah, blah, blah. If you have this vision of, quote, what peaceful parenting looks like, and then you beat yourself up when that's not what your family looks like, you're actually going to keep yourself further away from whatever goals that you have for your family. So really having that self-compassion, it doesn't mean you're going to stop trying just because you fall down and you mess up and you forgive yourself. It just means that you're not going to be moving forward with this you know, self-critical inner bully voice that's telling you that you're not good enough, which is you can never grow out of that spot. Yeah, that's a struggle. But I think from one of your podcast episodes, I forget who it was with, but they gave that mantra of, I'm not alone. Like everybody struggles with this. Mm -hmm. And I've tried to do that with myself. Good. I'm a recovering perfectionist. Good. So I try to, you know, I'm I'm not alone. Like this is really hard. Other people struggle with this. Yeah, it was, um, we had Kristen Neff on, who's a really wonderful self-compassion teacher. So we'll link to that one in the show notes as well. But it's it's so important to have self-compassion when when things are hard. It's like, you know, I want that to be your go-to. So that's another thing that you can practice for, for the next time we talk. All right. So we'll catch up in a few weeks and see how things are. Okay. Well, that sounds, sounds great. Good. Thank you so okay. much, Sarah. Yes, thank you. You're so welcome. Bye for now. Bye. Bye. Hi, Erin. Hi, Wade. Welcome back to the podcast. Hi, Hi. Thank you. Thank you for having us back. Okay. So give us an update. How have things been since the last time we talked? Well, I guess we did a lot of talking about food last time, so we can start there. Sure. I think it's really helped for us to just kind of have like a mantra, like, you know, they're, they're growing healthy, they're growing well, you know, and to take some of that pressure off from ourselves. Awesome. And we just kind of let a lot of things go that we used to be real sticklers about. And we tried incorporating dessert with the meal to let them do that. How did that work? I feel like they're still getting used to it because they'll say like, can we have dessert? And I've said to them, like when we don't serve it with the meal, say if, you know, our new family routine is going to be if the dessert is out, we're having dessert. If not, we're not. And so they still ask once in a while, but they usually do dive right into that first and then... Are you finding that they still eat their other dinner, even if they have the dessert first? I would say yes, at least to the extent that they would have otherwise, because, you know, we, we limit the portion. We don't give them a whole bucket of ice cream and say, go to right. town, you know, yeah. give them a scoop or two. And once they finish, that's awesome. they'll usually ask for more and we'll be like, no, I'm sorry. That, you know, that's it for dessert. And then, then they'll kind of pick at their plate a little and then maybe eat a little bit more. 
Okay, so it's working pretty well. And then one thing I, I, I did talk with him about is that we are going to, with the safe food choices, especially if it's like a carby safe food, we kind of put out less, I, I guess, of, you know, so th- so it's limited on the table. And like once it's out, it's out rather than here's a five pound right. thing of right. rice, it's, you know. Exactly. So, yeah. Like a loaf of bread or something. <laughs> but one thing I did kind of have a question on is like our oldest daughter, she will like rice, 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 rice. And you know, we've kind of said to her, like, wait, like, you can't clear out the rest of the pot, you know, mm-hmm. to see if your siblings want a little extra, because she'll just keep going for that before she eats chicken or a veggie or something. So- yeah, I think I've I've had parents ask about that before, like, you know, what if you're having cantaloupe and one kid just wants to eat the entire thing, but the other kid wants some too. Like, I think it's reasonable to say, you know, you can have your proportion of what's there. Like there has to be some left for everybody else. Like say it is cantaloupe and there's two kids, you can have half of what's there because then your, you know, your brother or your sister is going to want some too. So it's not, you know, it's not fair to eat the whole thing and not let anybody else have any. So I think that sounds right what you're doing. Okay. Yeah. That's kind of what we were doing is like, say if it's rice or something, we'd kind of look at it and and put it into thirds and say like, you know, you can have this this much, but you know, yeah. you can save some for your brother and sister if they want more. And then, and then I guess maybe like if their brother or sister is finished and they're not going to have any more rice, then maybe your daughter could have more at that point or something. Yeah, yeah that's, that's what, what we've, we've been done. doing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Ask the other two kids, "Are you done eating?" You know, and they'll say yes or no, and then they'll say, "Okay, go ahead, you can have more." Yeah, that seems good. That seems like good, like good manners modeling too. Like if you go to a dinner party and it's your favorite, you know, favorite dip on the buffet table, you're not going to take all of it. <laughs> I might, depending on what it is. <laughs> and who saw you, right? If you could get away with it. <laughs> yeah. And I, I will say that the cognitive behavioral therapy has really been helping me in particular. Like I notice when I start getting anxious that they're just eating a carb or, you know, they're just eating carrots and A1, just saying to myself, they're growing well. And I know they're growing well because I've just had them at the doctor. And she said, my son is in the 75th percentile for height and weight. So and he's a good, really strong boy. So you're able to talk back to that worry in your in your yeah. head. That's awesome. Yeah, that's been really helpful. Good. And I think that probably we didn't talk about this much last time, but it's really important for family meal time to feel like relaxed and warm. And if you're always like, you know, on people to eat more, or eat less or eat this or don't eat that uh, and you're feeling anxious, then it's not going to make yeah. the family meal time feel very nice. Yeah, that was yeah. definitely one of the biggest things we struggled with and since we are fortunate enough to eat so many meals together as a family, that's what I kind of said to him is like, we, we have to take the stress out of it. Like we are yeah. the problem here. Yeah. And you get a tummy ache too, if you're stressed, stressed yeah. out when you're eating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. Well, a couple of the things we talked about while we're still on the food topic is um, what did you decide to do with the Halloween candy? Oh, so I, we, we, I really loved your idea. We'll, we'll buy it off of you the rest of it. I did pitch that to the kids and I don't really think they were so keen on that, but we did end up telling them and we haven't followed through on it yet, but we're just going to do a few more pieces or something, right? And then we're just going to toss the rest of the buckets. Yeah. So and I, there are some places you can donate it to. Yeah. I mean, I think we talked about kind of like giving them like a, a quota, like you can have so many pieces, pick yeah. your favorite ones. And then after that, you know, we'll just okay, cool. do something with Good. them. Yeah. Yeah. Also, another thing I saw online was you can do science experiments with candy. So that might be fun for your homeschooling. Like yeah, we do have up. a lot. We have a lot of those planned. Like we used Skittles last year to have the colors bleed and they thought Neat. that was really fun. And I have a peppermint one this year for like a Christmassy theme. So cool. Cool. Okay, great. Okay. So the other couple of things that we talked about were when Grayson was kind of getting a little wild when when everyone was trying to watch TV and you thought you might try and either have him be on a yoga ball, although you saw possible problems with that, or maybe like a wiggle chair or something. Yeah. So I don't know if at this point we had tried the, did, tried the wobble seat because I borrowed a wobble seat from... No, we, we borrowed that after. Okay. So I borrowed a, a wobble seat from the local library. You know, they're like the puffy things with mm-hmm. them. Mm-hmm. And that just turned into, can we stand and balance on it? Okay. Or can we make it into a projectile? So after that, we had our um, OT session on Friday, and I spoke with our really lovely OT, and she said that she would try some things in OT because I said, we're really struggling with this and we need some help. And she and I kind of spoke after, and she said she really felt that anything that was bouncy, wobbly, really kind of brings him up okay. in energy to, you know, they use the zones of regulation curriculum, mm-hmm. so they would say to the yellow zone. So our plan of action is 
um, we're going to try weighted things. Okay, good. So she's tried a few things at OT because we're going to try them at OT before we buy them because a lot of these things can be kind of pricey. Yeah, yeah. So she tried ankle weights. <laughs> he didn't like that. I'm not sure if she tried the compression vest yet or not, but one of our things to try to, and I know he sleeps better at night with is a weighted blanket. So mm-hmm. I'm hoping that we have, OT has been canceled last week for a snowstorm this week for mm. Christmas, next week for New Year's. Right. So I'm hoping that the next time we can try a weighted blanket there and they're going to start a lending library there, which is great. Oh, that's this awesome. Place where we go is great. So we can try some of the like weighted things that he might great idea. Not well to at OT first. Yeah. And, and maybe he watches TV with a weighted blanket on his lap or yeah, something like that. Yeah. That was exactly what we were thinking. Yeah. We were hoping cool. to get him back into the rocking because a few nights he's been rocking and he seems slightly more regulated. We tried a bunch of different things. I said, you know, maybe it's because it's been so cold. I've been getting them outside, but we've had them outside for, they were outside for hours this weekend and he's still kind of amped up at, at night. So yeah. Well, yeah, oh, and also I mean, he's a spirited five-year-old boy, right? Yeah. yeah. Like just lots of energy. Yeah, yeah. Another thing we were going to try is to just end TV time a little sooner, yeah. you know, not get so close to bedtime, but it's kind of hard, you know, around dinner times really when we kind of need it to, mm-hmm. to get dinner ready. Mm-hmm. So that's probably not going to move much on that end. Well, maybe you could just not do, I don't know if you do any after dinner, but maybe you could cut that out if you did any after dinner and just keep it to before dinner when you're getting the getting dinner ready or something. Yeah. Well, that kind of is a good segue into the next topic, if you don't mind. Uh, Great. <laughs> is some things that I guess we try to do for ourselves, right? And actually that time period right after dinner, we have been putting them on the TV, but this kind of free to air up a little bit. Okay. She, yeah. she she does a lot of homeschool planning at that point, but if, if there's not a lot, then she'll squeeze in a little bit of, is it crochet? Is that what you said? Yeah, I've been doing, I crochet and listen to um, like an audio book or a podcast. Nice. <laughs> That's what That's I That's awesome. To your podcast or whatever other podcasts. Oh, great. So yes, and that was our sort of third and final thing that we talked about was um, finding time for you two to get some downtime so that you're not quite so burnt out. Yeah, but still, I feel like a struggle. I mean, it's just really hard when you have no support, mm-hmm. you know, when we're, we tend to be people that don't ask for a lot of help and just mm-hmm. try to persevere on our own and, you know, no matter the cost to us sometimes. And I know that's detrimental, but now I just, that's one of our biggest struggles that we still need to really work on, I guess. And yeah. It's, it's hard because we live in a rural community, you know, so there's not a ton of people around to begin with. You know, and the people that are around, they're kind of spread out, you know, mm-hmm. our family lives far away and, you know, online help is great, but it's not going to take the kids off from our hands, you know, yeah. so we do something. What about, I don't think we talked about this last time, but what about getting like a fun teenager to come and play with them? Like, you know, I know you're nervous about leaving the kids with people, but if you're there and they have just someone that, you know, can run around outside with them and play ball and just do some fun things outside, you know, to give you a little bit of time and space. Yeah. Like a mom's helper. Yeah. 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 That is a good idea for the year. I mean, I had thought about that with, I have some really great family friends back home in New York that are more like family and um, she's not my niece, but she's going to be 17 next year. And I asked her, Hey, do you want to come spend the summer in New England? And you know, Oh, that'd be amazing. So I don't want to be like by myself with the kids. I said, no, I would be around and you'd be a mama's helper type. Yeah. So that's great. And even maybe now before that happens or if, you know, before the summer, I know you're involved in the homeschooling community and maybe there's some like older kids in the, you know, who are homeschooled who might want to do some mother's help parent helper things. Yeah. Yeah. Some older homeschooling kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a good idea. There's nothing like a fun, you know, young teenager to play with kids. Yeah. That is, that is a really good idea. That's a good idea. Yeah. I mean, in the past we've had some, um, I guess I'll say some like college age students for babysitters and to kind of, for like a little break in period, we've had them kind of wash the kids while we're around usually a little bit. So it's the same kind of idea. Yeah. Although in that situation, we're paying them. It'd be nice to be able to just have someone that wants to play with them without having to pay them. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, you might have to pay them a little bit, but probably, you know, maybe they could do, you know, babysitting course of study or something like that for Mm -hmm. their home school. (laughs) Okay. Well, I I mean, it sounds like that's going to be a work in progress, you know, and I can, I encourage you to keep it on your list to try and find that downtime for each other. I love that, Aaron, that you're getting a start on that with your with your crochet. And, you know, it, you both need it and you can't be the parents that you want to be with with really low resources on and on. You know, of course, we go through peri- temporary periods 
whereas sometimes we can't help it, but just on an ongoing basis, you got to keep thinking about how can we fill our own cups. Yeah, that really did resonate with me last time. And I keep thinking every time I feel stressed out, like I, I need to get on this because I, I can't be the mom I want to be feeling completely stretched to the max. So you can't, you can't, there's no way. It's, it's hard to reverse that trend though, when you've spent what apparently years now, right? Mm-hmm. Sacrificing all your time for your children to try to take some hard, but not impossible. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's, it may be a slow process, but if you keep working on it, you'll, you will be able to, to turn it around. Yeah, it's true. Was there anything else that you wanted to ask me? At this point, no, not really, unless you have any teenagers that want to come. Oh, I wish if we were closer, my daughter would. She loves playing with little kids. <laughs> yeah, she went to, a, there was a Christmas party in our community yesterday, and she's, she, for little kids, like it was a little kid's Christmas party, and she went to it and said, I'm going to go drum up some business. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> well, tell her to send some other teens our way that want to play All with right. those. <laughs> okay, well, it was good to meet you both, and please keep in touch and keep me filled in on how things are going. For you. Thank you so much, Sarah. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Yeah, it was a pleasure to meet you. And I'm sending you, you know, the strength to keep trying to put yourselves on that list of things to do. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. I hope you found this conversation insightful and exactly what you needed in this moment. Be sure to subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast platform and leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Remember that I'm rooting for you. I see you out there showing up for your kids and doing the best you can. Sending hugs over the airwaves today. Hang in there. You've got this.